already chosen because it's a research topic that's um, of uh, validity to the kinds of projects that we've actually got going on in the lab that I direct, uh, the Educational Informatics uh, Laboratory at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. You'll see the little um, graphic down here, and there's the uh, lab graphic. Um, I like to have each of the participants, so these are colleagues of mine in the laboratory itself, um, who are going to participate in this process today. Um, by the way, all of you are welcome to come and join us in this space. The space is actually defined by a URL that is given right there, and I can increase the size of that just temporarily. So if you want to, come and join us and join in the chat uh, in the bottom right hand corner here. That would be absolutely wonderful. Um, so the URL that you're looking at is this one here, uic.gosnet.com, MN General Room underscore 2016. Um, bigger yet. Oh no! Good enough? That's as big as I can get it. I think. Yeah. Just the way that I've got it set up in here. Um, the other piece, uh, I can do it this way as well. Let me set up a pod. This is the nice thing about uh, the way that we actually use this environment as well. That you can actually get students to actually set these things up and they go to town with these kinds of processes. And I'm not going to be able to do it that way. In the meantime, uh, while I'm doing this, Ulana, can you introduce yourself? Please? Lana <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't like that. Judith, you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, can everyone hear me? We're good. Good to go. Uh, uh, my name is Judith, and uh, I have been, uh, I'm a former grad student of Roland's, and i um, happy to be here, and my background is in adult literacy, and uh, I um, did some research and used the uh, repertory grid technique uh, during my research, during my uh, graduate studies, and I'm just here today to um, learn more and participate in the, in the, um, in the online focus group methodology. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Wendy? Hi everybody, hope you're doing okay. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at UOIT and I work as a colleague with Roland in EI Lab and I also study uh, wearable technology and health and physical education so I'm really interested in how we can bring that to kind of quote face-to-face Things we might feel in, in the physical education class into the, you know, the affective component of digital learning. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Lena, I know that you got scared earlier, but you're back. So you wanted to take a stab at uh, introducing yourself? I thought it was a comment on me. I got out of class. Uh, I'm just completing my uh, master's thesis about uh, the role of informal online communities of practice in professional learning. So what we're doing here, so what the, the Congress is taking place and the exercise of community participating in it, is this type of uh, consensual community building that I'm investigating. Uh, and uh, my area of interest is how to assist uh, teachers across borders to take advantage of the online community for their professional learning. Thank you. Uh, Marisa, I muted you because uh, you seem to be taking up a, an inordinate amount of bandwidth, but uh, do you want to introduce yourself at this point? So Maurice is on a mobile device, so it's a little bit uh, more tricky.
tricky to actually switch from one affordance to another affordance or the ability to do certain kinds of things. Maurice, you there? actually elicit elements and then constructs, we are probably not going to get to the point where we're actually going to be doing the rating of the elements against the constructs, um, but that would be a very similar process to uh, the one that I outlined on Thursday in the pre-conference uh, workshop. And if you want to have additional um, uh, insights as to exactly what that would be like, I sent a copy of uh, my notes and the PowerPoint to Nadia, so she's going to disper disperse it uh, against or across the entire uh, participants in the, in the conference. Um, so one of the first things that we do when we start going through this process, and I'm just going to get rid of this pod a second, is to uh, start to find not only what the topic is, okay, we've got somebody coming in, okay, and more people, all right. Um, so what we do is, is start uh, defining the topic and um, in this particular instance we, we've got a series of projects that are all related to fully online learning community model which is a model, a theoretical framework that we're actually setting up. Um, it's related to the community of inquiry model that comes out of Athabasca University, um, Randy Garrison, Terry Anderson and uh, Walter Archer. Um, but it's a, a derivative of it, so there are some modifications to it. And we're using this model for the basis of our online programs, both at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level. So what we're trying to do is actually establish some empirical evidence to support this particular model in terms of the way that it's actually working in both of those two uh, programs. So the topic is fairly well defined. Part of what goes on in this particular model, and I'll give you an example or a, a a schematic of what the model looks like at this point. This is an earlier version of it, but it, it still has the same functionality. There's social presence, we've got uh, cognitive presence. The space in between in terms of the overlap is collaborative learning, so people are collaborating as they're going through the processes that were uh, suggested by um, Francois this morning. But because it's totally online or fully online um, environment, it's working within a digital space. So part of that digital space is co-created with the students. In other words, what we do is outline a basic sandbox within which to play, but then the students actually come up with extensions, other tools, other affordances that they actually want to make use of that will allow them to perform various tasks, etc. So one of the questions that we're interested in, in this particular project is, so what kind of tools are people interested in? How much awareness do they have of the kinds of tools that are available? So these could be web 2.0 tools, in other words, social media types of uh, experiences, or they could be web 3.0 or semantic kinds of tools that are starting to become available uh, over time. 
For those of you who are not quite sure about the, the, the web 2.0 is not a problem, right? Everybody knows about Facebook and Twitter and all those kinds of things, right? The web 3.0 tools are a little bit more yeah, esoteric perhaps. And um, maybe one of the illustrations that I could uh, um, use with you is how many people have had the experience of going and shopping at Amazon.com? Okay, a lot of people. Um, by the way, Amazon.ca is the same experience, right? Um, anyways, if you go to Amazon, it's really kind of an interesting experience because you can choose to pick up a number of different items that you want to put into your, your uh, shopping cart. As soon as you choose an item to look at, even if you don't put it in your shopping cart, Amazon does something. What does it do? It shows you other items that are what other people have chosen bought. by other people, right? So there's an algorithm built right into the website that does that kind of comparison to what other people have actually um, seen. So it's it, it's a very very simplistic well, perhaps, a uh, form of artificial intelligence that's built into the website itself. And that is a very rudimentary example of uh, Web 3.0 type of uh, functionality. Um, there are other examples, for instance, if you uh, have taken a look at what Google does um, with their advertising, Google 3.0 or Google um, search brings up all kinds of things that are related specifically to your Profile. Well, where do they get the characteristics of your profile? Well, those come from every search that you do through Google, regardless of what it is. So they're gathering all of this information. By the way, you can turn that off if you want to, and you should probably, depending on what it is that you're doing. Um, so they're gathering all this information about who you are based on the kinds of searches that you use through Google. And then they use that as a mechanism for figuring out exactly what kind of advertising would be probably most appropriate to you, with the possibility that they're going to be able to actually sell you something. Somewhere along the line. Anyways, um, so let's move on from there. Uh, so that's our topic, Web 2.0, 3.0 kinds of tools and the awareness of them. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and nobody has uh, reminded me yet, is turn on a recording. Yeah, we forgot. <laughs> and I didn't this time. Um, and ask for each of you to fill in the uh, elicitation pods that I've got set up already. And um, I, I want you to use, and I lost it now. So where's my questions? There they are. So I've got a, a, a question pod here, and I'm going to ask you to come up with five or six elements answering the question, which web two and three tools are you aware of which are useful for eliciting learner understanding of concepts, models, and theories? So just fill in the pods uh, individually, and uh, we'll go from there. Everybody all right? All right, so how would you answer these kinds of things? So what kinds of elements would you come up with in terms of Web 2, Web 3 tools that you're aware of that are valuable for eliciting learner understanding of concepts, models, and theories? They can't cheat. Anybody? Yes. I'm not sure if uh, it would fit in the category of 2.0, 3.0, but there's this uh, new stuff thing coming up by the name Ripen. Okay. So what they do is they have the industrial cases there and uh, companies they are there, and they let the students come and choose their organization, and they get a credit. So the teachers they're encouraging teachers, and a lot of universities are actually adopting to it. So University of Waterloo just started doing it. Okay. Uh, previously, I think I saw Lazarita School of Business there, McMaster, and a few other Canadian universities there. So it becomes more of a case study, a live case study kind of project with 20%, 30% weightage. And students work with the companies for about eight weeks, 
or maybe for the whole term 13 weeks and then they submit something at the end and they get a credit for it and the companies get valuable stuff done through their project so it's like an applied thing so it's sort of crowdsourcing applied specifically to cases yes um reichman as in r-e-i no it's r-i-i-p-e-n oh. that's how they spell it r-i-i-p-e-n Yes, ripen. Ripen? Yep. Uh, we just lost her. There we go. Sorry. I think that was me. Maybe somebody else. All right. Uh, any other tools? Maurice, are you not able to fill in your pot? It's on the wall. Yeah, he has the capability. Um, by the way, there is an Adobe Connect um, uh, app for both the Android uh, platform as well as the, um, the Apple OS, iOS, whatever it's called these days. Two are becoming very close to each other, um, and they're free. All right, so we've got uh, three individuals that have three sets. What I'm going to do now is go through a process uh, with you of um, doing some consensual um, determination as to which of the elements that we're actually going to be looking at together. So if somebody want to come up and, Lana, can you, um, I think it's in behind here somewhere. Okay, I think it's will oh. uh, I'll try and click on it. There it is right there, behind yours. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'll put it in front of mine. doesn't matter to me. Or, you know what, I'm going to make it a little bit narrower. Uh, and this will become our... our, our uh, oh, right, Maurice or something? Mess. All right. Um, so let's go through a consensual basis. What, what do we see in common across the three uh, lists that we have right now that you would want to include? as part of these tools that we're putting together. Whether it's collaborate, eliminate, any of the, you know, we do we use Adobe Connect, but any synchronistic video webcam. Okay, uh, audio video uh, conferencing tool of some kind, okay. Mm -hmm. Can we deal with synchronous video tool? Everybody all right with that? Yeah. Okay, another okay. one? Uh, let's see, social media. And All right. The parts as well as the great S, great N, great S. <laughs> so, do you want to come up with a specific um, uh, description of no, that? No. Would you like me to put down a moniker for that, or did you want to refer to a specific one? Or? Well, hey, I'm not in uh, charge of this process. You guys are. So, what do you want? I'm throwing it out there. Yeah, I just, I would just say general social media because you know. Yeah. Okay. Continuing to change, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is the only one. I, I would also say Google Docs. That's a really great way to work. Whether there's other programs that can do that as well. So called collaborative documents. Collaborative. Can we say? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I've been back collaborative tools, collaborative yeah. platforms. I, I was thinking like a G, G Suite um, because it's, it's more than just Google Docs. Um, yes. You can collaborate with. Okay, one of the other things that, that we should probably be talking about is, is talking aloud as we're going through, giving a rationale for why these actually fit uh, the response to the question. So can we move backwards a little bit? Uh, why do we need to have synchronous video tool AV conferencing in there? in our list. For me, it's very important that students or participants, whatever the meeting or debate is, have their webcams on because we can see face-to-face -face expressions and body language and things that really add to the social presence. Um, if that's not available, I think it's easier for people to kind of disappear or not be as present. So it, it gives us the impression that we're, we're in the same space. Because we are in the same space, so that's why I said it was very important because it adds that sort of 
human aspect. You're actually speaking to people and working with people. And as you can see, you learn who's talking and whether there's a bit of a lag and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of learn how to work together, but having a body network helps a lot. Okay, um, any other views or even dissensions? Um, for, for me, the, the, the video conferencing, um, in addition to the uh, synchronous, uh, just the asynchronous, uh, um, sort of ability to chat and make notes and those kinds of things, um, um, I think that that sort of helps develop learner autonomy and uh, resilience because you need to be able to formulate and communicate your ideas, um, make conjectures, open your ideas to reputation or, or um, crit critique, constructive criticism, and um, by doing that, um, you know, you're, you're sort of opening yourself up for an opportunity to learn something new. And so um, the combination of the, uh, the synchronous sort of like the, the visual uh, component, the synchronous video, as well as the chat, I think is actually um, so we can see each other, but also um, use the tools that are within the audio, uh, audio, uh, sorry, audio, <laughs> video conferencing um, to sort of put your ideas together and, and put them out there. I think that's important. You know what else I think is, is really good? Because we're dealing with you know, critiquing and solving problems together, I think if, if you try to do this on something like a learning management system on Blackboard, it gives you a time delay for your response. Whereas I can see your reaction if, it, if someone's disagreeing with me or not, and I have a better chance to gauge immediately as opposed to having that edit, which may be useful at some other times as well, but that filter where we think, oh, that person logged that on three days ago on Facebook, and now I have to go back and comment, it's not as relevant, right? So this is a lot richer because if we disagree, I can see see that and we, there's a more affect, more emotion involved, I think, because you're more invested because you can actually have that temporal reaction. Okay, so... I'd like to say to, to that effect, uh, in so-called real life, uh, our interactions are multidimensional and they are immediate. And so any change of thinking is obvious to us. We may not understand it, but it is obvious to us because it is made obvious to us in the moment. We're able to replicate that in this environment because of the simultaneity of what's happening here audio and visually as well as textually. Uh, that is extremely important if we are going to gauge not only alignments and dissension, but changes in thinking. Because as Francois said earlier today, it's about uh, developing epistemological competency. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just back up a little bit and go back to Wendy, and you were saying you can actually see the reactions. In fact, we, we, we talk about in, in the lab uh, two different kinds of, of reactions, one of those being body language, so in other words, how you're actually carrying your body when you're on, on webcam, but we're also usually dealing with facial expressions. Wendy, do you want to talk a little bit about the importance of facial expressions in terms of the work that we actually do? Sure. One of the things in the lab that, that we've done is um, take a look at the, the Nola Suite um, with um, face reader, which can actually, yeah, face reader, sorry, which can actually identify sort of seven emotions based on points on the face, um, so that we can actually measure people's reactions. So we've had a chance to have people do tasks while we have various cameras around the lab looking at their face. One of which is square on the face. And we can identify things like happiness, anger, um, I can't remember all of them, but some that have been identified already and, and have been validated. So it's, it's interesting to be able to identify those and see people's reactions to those. So that's, that's a big project that, that we've been using the space here. So what I'd like to reiterate here is that one of the reasons why we're recording this, we're recording this all as a video and it's available to us after afterwards, is that we can actually go back into that video, isolate any one of those faces, throw it into Face Reader, which is a software package, and get it to do the analysis, and that would actually be synchronized with the rest of the, the conversation that's going on. 
So you can do content analysis, you can do conversation, discourse analysis, as well as the facial expression kind of piece. And we're getting to the, the body language uh, after a bit as well. And, and these can all give us additional insights in terms of what's actually happening in the black box between people's ears, um, in addition to what they're actually saying um, on, on, uh, on the recording itself and within the elicitation process. Um, let's have one more uh, element that's going to be in common and then we'll go through the triadic elicitation process, coming up with a couple of uh, different um, um, constructs. And that probably will take us to the end of the time that we've got available since we've only got half an hour left. So something else that's in common and the reason why we should include it Now they're all shy. No, you know what it is, Ron? I think it's just thinking. You still have to wait time. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just thinking that that is, you know, because some of the things people think, oh, just get there and someone talking in an online space, but it's okay to just allow that too. I find, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes it lets what I find as an instructor is it lets the quieter kids kind of think it's okay to speak up, so they're, you know, because it's just like a regular discussion that people who, like myself, talk too much. <laughs> yeah, in, in my grad course, this actually becomes a, a really interesting uh, piece because people get very uncomfortable with dead air, and yet it's really <laughs> effective because not only do they have to have, to have time to, to think, but they also have to have time to, to come up with either a response to a question that was coming up or trying to work through the entire process that they're, they're uh, dealing with. Can I, ask Can I just add something on this score? Sure. Um, scientists of neuroplasticity also suggest that the time you, that you spend uh, thinking quietly, you are also breathing in more oxygen and it allows you to think in conceptual heights better. I think it's in our defense. <laughs> So in other words, what we need to do is start making use of other physiological signs of what's going on as well. And it, as far as that goes, we, we have been moving in this direction. So the, the oldest suite of tools that we actually have available comes from behavioral sciences, taking a look at uh, behavior of animals originally. Um, but they have a whole suite of tools, including uh, tools like EEGs, ECGs, etc that we can now start tying to individuals and so you can start measuring all of these pieces in addition to you know, the, uh, the obvious ones that we're seeing in terms of the webcam and the microphone and uh, facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are moving in that direction, slowly, but we are going there. All right, so we still don't have a fourth element. It seems to me that the fourth element might be socially constructed uh, research or research tools. Okay, such as? Can you give us an example? Well, uh, such as either Google Scholar, which is a, a subdomain uh, of uh, scholarly uh, search, or even the bibliographic communal, <coughs> excuse me, communal bibliographic platforms like Zotero, uh, which allow and no. both personal and, and uh, uh, group uh, curation. Okay, so does everybody understand? what we're referring to there. Reference managers, I don't know if that language is, is more common. Um, there are some online ones that are, are social media, essentially. So if you go take a look at Mendeley uh, as an example, or Zotero, you can actually set up libraries that are shared amongst a number of people. I generally speak, speaking use this with my, um, my graduate students where we set up a library of all of the research that they're doing while they're going through a particular course, and then it becomes available for everybody in the entire course, rather than having to rely upon one tool. What yeah. about virtual reality? We have someone who wants to ask a question. Yep, exactly. On the same page. Go ahead. What about the use of virtual reality? Okay, uh, what do you mean? Um, well, they're starting to use um, virtual reality to um, give like tours of universities, um, do training or learning, I guess, sorry, <laughs> uh, learning together. And uh, so they're using that te technology as a platform in which to uh, uh, have an experience together. Yeah, uh, so. I was just wondering if that was. Yeah, thanks, Tristan. Um, in fact, we are moving very uh, 
uh, quickly into that particular area. Wendy, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Because this is more your area. VR, sorry. He couldn't hear anything. Sorry, yeah, that, that's my fault. Uh, so the question that Tristan asked was about the use of VR as a, a tool to define the digital space as well. Yes, well, we're starting to use VR in the lab and with some of our partners at Northern College. We're just at the beginning of it at this stage, but mm -hmm. I think it'll be rapidly developing um, as a tool for one of the examples I can give is that we're wanting to develop a digital um, space for learning health education and or uh, learning physical skills in adapted ways through virtual reality as opposed to and, and being able to modify. Um, some of that's happening already. In, in game gaming, but uh, yeah. that's one of the areas that we're, we're really interested in is using that VR to um, have kids step into decision making roles in health education, for example, or stepping into scenarios where they're um, at Northern College using it for going down the mine shaft. So you use VR in a way that they can learn the things without being in danger or or where there was extra cost. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have to happen by going down the mine shaft to learn those things. So mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. lots of um, lots of models that we're taking a look at and uh, that'll be something exciting that we we'll do next. One of the other pieces that comes along with this is that VR is is supposed to be totally immersive, right? So you don't uh, there there's a, a break between the physical reality that you're uh, sitting within and what you're actually experiencing under the helmet and through your ears, etc. But that can be um, quite uh, disorienting to a, for a large uh, segment of the population, and as a result maybe one of the things that we should actually be looking at is the use of augmented reality. So that is, you know, taking a look at the visors that you've got, which allow some um, sunlight to be transmitted through it, so you can still see where you are, but you can also use that screen as essentially a screen that you can have right in front of your eyes that can be displaying additional information that you can't get from the physical environment around you. So we've uh, put together, some of my grad students have put together uh, augmented reality apps. So they took a look at what was happening in terms of the Toronto Transit Commission, um, the, the transit system in Toronto, and said, we're just not happy with the kinds of maps and schedules that you can get from the TTC itself. Mm -hmm. So what we could do, perhaps, is put together, uh, based on GPS, is an app that you can have on your smartphone that gives you the kind of route information for a particular uh, route um, that intersects with other bus routes or tram cars or uh, subway cars, etc. So you can actually plan out with a fair amount of, of um, detail your route from point A to point B with all of the transfers that you need to do within it, etc. And all that information shows up on your app. Um, it's been piloted. We, we ran through a couple of uh, uh, good pieces to it. Um, so we're moving in that kind of direction as well. So there, there's a couple of different things that we can work on here. All right, let's get back to this. So we've got four elements at this point in time. And if we were actually running this as a complete system, is there another question? Oh, sorry. And Louise, you wanted a question as well? Oh, that was uh, a long time ago. Okay, we sorry. About that space, so it might, might be irrelevant. We can talk about it later. Okay, so the question was about dead spaces, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that I'm going to hear about dead spaces later. Dead spaces, anyways. Dead spaces uh, later. <laughs> uh, so we've got four elements at this point in time. Let's go through a process of triadic elicitation. So if you want to bring up another pod, uh, Alana. Or maybe even the same one. Depends on how you want to do it. Oh, I'll just write it. I'll write it below. I'll make a little line. Okay, so and let's take the construct. Let's take the first three elements that we've got. So synchronous video tool, and maybe you, what you can do is expand the pot so that we can see it because now we're oh, going to dispense with all the, the individual okay. ones. Okay. So let's take the first three that are there. So synchronous video tool, AD conferencing, uh, social media networking, and collaborative tools such as uh, Google Suite. And let's do triadic elicitation. So which two are like the others, and which two is not? Or shall we sing the song from Sesame Street? Which two? Anyway, enough of that. 
educated in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it says something more about age than it does anything else. Era. So who's going to go? What are we doing? I think, well, I think that the, the, the age concept and the goals are similar because uh, it means you're in the same sort of social space as somebody else. Network or not actually uh, be there at the same time. Whereas I think synchronous video and G Suite, you would want to be working at the. You don't have to be working at the same time in those collaborative tools, but you can. So that's my first point. Okay. What, you what do the rest of you think? I would say there's something more sustained about the interactions in the first two as they're listed here. Whereas with social media, it tends to be uh, a more dispersed and momentary interaction or shorter term. Uh, so perhaps that um, sustained activity is, is something that, that differentiates the two. Hey, can yeah. you come up with that terminology again? So dispersed or momentary is what, what you said for social media? Uh, Sure. <laughs> I, I think this is in line with what Wendy was talking about, right? Same kind of idea? Yeah. Yeah, very much so, because I think that that's uh, those are good words. I like that. The first momentary, usually shorter bursts, as opposed to people have longer time and more investment in the first two, I think. Um, oh, invested uh, might be a good term to use. I don't know how you feel about that. So for which? Uh, for the the coupling of the first two. So vested interest? Well, I don't know. I think you have a vested interest in, in all of those interactions. Otherwise, you wouldn't be participating. But um, I agree with that. <coughs> yeah. The first two, I think, there's more, I guess, investment relates more to the development of community. Yes. Investment is a better word. Right, so social media, you can have 5 billion followers, but you may not be part of the community or feel that you are part of the community as much. Um, now, unless you form the group, of course, that's a different right. sort of sub-community right. formation and so on. Um, but if we're talking about the totality of the experience, um, think of, I, I would personally think of social media as sort of a network individualism, you know, in, in a way while uh, the other two platforms uh, are a form of ongoing community while you are there. Mm -hmm. um, Rana, why do you, why do you uh, say that, I just, I'm curious why you say that social media is not work individuality? Uh, and why do you, uh, why, why do you describe it that way? From just from my own experience or how I view how other people are participating, um, more often than not, people come in and out uh, because, of course, they feel comfortable to and there's no reason that you can't uh, do so. While if you're in a, a synchronous space for whatever finite period of time, you're invested in that community moment, I suppose. Uh, you're not, unless you're being kicked out for technical reasons, leaving for that reason. Okay, stop. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Ron. No, I'm, so I, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to type either because we're creating a new language. <laughs> Adobe Esperanto. Yeah, well, here, here's the problem with a notepad in Adobe Connect. There is one cursor in, in a notepad. So you can only have one person actually in charge of the notepad, even though everybody's got access to it. Mm -hmm. if, if I used a different kind of pod, a share pod that shows up as a, uh, an interactive whiteboard, then we can have as many different cursors as you want uh, in, into that particular space. So the, the choice of tool determines the kind of interaction that you can actually experience as well. Um, so that, that's why we were having a little bit of war here. Um, so construct one seems to be somewhere along the line of sustained 
community owned on one? Go ahead. You were supposed to be doing this, Atlanta. Go for it. Sustained okay. community owned. <laughs> but I think that Wendy was still wanted to put something in. Wendy, did you still want to type something in there? No, I typed them all around the stockings. I was there. Okay. <laughs> so okay. All right. Let's just go with that. For now, we can always modify. Yeah, and so, and rather than coming up with a um, uh, uh, a second um, construct, uh, I think you can see the process that we're running through here. So it's a negotiated process as we're we're using a focus group kind of orientation. There's a lot of reliance on talking through what your rationale is for, um, each of the choices that you're coming up with. There's a necessity to actually reach or move towards consensus, not necessarily reach consensus. There are opportunities in this kind of process for dissension to actually occur. Um, we can have people not agree and we can leave those out as uh, additional choices uh, for constructs as we're coming up with um, these uh, elements and constructs. Um, and then, of course, the next thing that we would do is start taking a look at all of the constructs versus all of the elements that were chosen by the entire group and do individual ratings. Uh, there are a number of ways of doing this. Uh, one of them is to do it independently so I can actually put a form together and send those out electronically to everybody so that they can actually do the, um, the ratings themselves and then I'd have to do some kind of statistical analysis to come up with you know, nothing more complex than a mean um, and use that as a way of rating the entire group. Or we could go through a consensual process determining what would be the best rating point. Um, or we can have multiple rating points that we could actually have for each of the elements against the, the constructs. Um, and then we can put all of the information into RepGrid. And for those of you who are still looking for um, access to the RepGrid uh, materials themselves, you will find an example of RepGrid at. I've got to put my glasses on, otherwise I can't read it. Grid.eilab.ca. All right, um, I think that's as far as we're going to go with this particular process. We're at quarter after at this point in time. So I'd like to have um, either questions from, from uh, the audience or we can have views by each of the participants as to what they were thinking about the process as we're going through, through it. So the choice is up to you. We can do a combination of the two as well. Yep, go ahead. I'm just wondering out of the market what will happen if um, kind of participants they have never worked with, with a tool like this before and they're sitting at home and how long will it take? I guess it will take an hour or two to, until I have all my eight participants ready for going to the process. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, I'm giving everybody a lot of control here because we're all experienced individuals. If you want, you can actually reduce the amount of requirements by uh, only giving people participant rights. So okay. once you get participant rights, you don't have the access to all of these pods, you can't set them up. Oh. All you can do is exactly what has been uh, provided to you. Uh, so there, there's a variety of different uh, permission levels inside the program itself. Um, there are also other programs that you can use besides Adobe Connect that, again, have either more or less kinds of affordances that you might want to take advantage of. For instance, if you are um, familiar with Blackboard, they have an audio video conferencing system inside Blackboard itself. It's called Collaborate, which has a lot fewer it's a very different orientation and, and there's less uh, opportunity for people to actually share in the open way that we are doing here. We, we chose this particular platform, at least he had a lot to do with it, uh, when we, we set up the programs to begin with because it fits so well with our pedagogy. But there are lots of other tools that uh, give you uh, far less freedom. Yeah. Yes. The question is, is if I wanted to use all these functions, how long, and especially how would you organize? Uh, so normally for everyone, we would have a large mic and okay. we can have a meeting like this so people could just talk back and forth, but we didn't have that today, but that's what we would do so that we could all, everybody could be heard who's from far away and we could hear you as well. But um, this is 
is what happens in our, our BA and our grad courses. There's always a mix of people who have had some experience and others who have had no experience. And I think as facilitators, we try to integrate that because they're all learning from each other. And it takes a little bit of courage to get that power in the room, but I think that's the way to set it up so that students will just take the leap and start to learn how to move. It's, it's okay, we try to just get in and play around. And, you know, um, everybody can upload, change the screen, and there becomes a certain uh, part of the social presence that's an ethical kind of stance so that you learn to respect when someone's talking or you learn to pause for the lag or you don't move everything around the room so you feel like you're a bad Prezi experience. Um, you know, that, that happens for the first class, but very, very quickly, students learn very, very fast that it, how, how to navigate, um, which is part of their digital competence as well. So now that they have all the social, no, I'm sorry, it's not also, I was just, I was trying, trying, yep. uh, and you have my microphone, I'm speaking now. Uh, now, it, it's interesting, I thank you very much for this kind of workshop, because we are really experiencing what happens, and it's the best way, the only way, I think, to learn about this kind of tools. Well, there is a better way yet if you were the actual participants. But I couldn't figure out a way of being able to do that. She could have been, right? You just saw it then when you put your mic on, right? And again, in these environments, you learn pretty quickly, okay, you speak it off, the mic's on, you know, get the feedback in the room. There's a lot of technical bits and pieces that go together with just effectively making it work. And as I said, I think... Yeah, yeah. But you get feedback in the room as you get it now, right? Because it's just... Uh, People need to know which speaker they have on which. Yep, mic exactly. Yep. But having everyone, not having it in the room, having everyone in the virtual room, even when there are people physically together, is really important. As I touched on earlier, to, to normalising that experience, and I think it enhances your ability to to um, to have a, a workshop style approach, in my opinion, because no longer can someone hide at the back. Mm -hmm or, you know, dominate from the front, everybody's experience is normalised, and so you can regulate these environments, in fact, in my opinion, far more effectively than, than a classroom setting. Yeah, it, that, that's an interesting point. You know, I, I can do this kind of thing in a physical classroom, and guess what happens? <laughs> but in that classroom, that bedroom, it makes no difference. I can lean in as much as I want to the camera. Well, I already have a big head, but... Yeah, so it's really kind of interesting, and one of our studies is actually focused in on that. So what kind of role, what kind of interactions uh, and kinds of effects that they actually have on individuals in this kind of a space. Uh, we haven't done the analysis, but we've got uh, 16 individuals who've gone through about an hour and a half of video, so we've got that to look forward to for the rest of the summer. I'm not sure that I'm going to see too much sun. Um, other comments, other questions? Yeah, pretty uh, In terms of the behavioral sciences, it's just the GSR with the possibility for measuring additional data? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to. So, what I would do is I would take all of the data, so the video. Uh, I would probably come up with a transcript of all the audio as well. No, I mean, it's like a, a before, uh, additional methods like EEG or something like this. Yeah, yeah. Are in other oh, okay, yeah. This is what I mean. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of things that are starting to become available. Um, in fact, one of our cognitive psychologists from social sciences is taking a look at a, um, a portable EEG machine and we're trying to figure out, well, they have to get it to begin with, so they need to uh, find some funding. Um, but if they actually do get that, then how can we actually incorporate that into the kind of work that we're doing here as well? So there are tons of, of uh, different sensors out there. We also have the handheld sensors that are available, so we can do um, carbon dioxide concentration, oxygen content, um, heart rate. Oh, by the way, we can do heart rate with um, uh, face reader. Face reader is so precise that it can actually measure the movements of um, arteries, uh, arteries in your forehead and you can get heart rate out of that. So it changes in heart rate as you're going through these kinds of processes. If your heart speeds up because of your response to certain kinds of things, we can incorporate that kind of information as well.
Haven't done it yet. But. <laughs> what was that story, Wendy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shows up with this big red sign. Um, if there are no further questions, yeah, go ahead. Can I just deviate from this main topic? It's still related to online sure. education, but I just wanted to hear from the experts here. So what's the perfect online way to administer exams? Uh, That's like a challenge that I think universities are still. And my response is, why do you want to run exams? True, but I mean, in order to administer, well, at the University of Waterloo, we still have uh, this kind of provision that all online programs they either have to find a proctor that's in their vicinity or they have some contracts with the universities like UBC or other so they could go there if they're within 100 kilometer radius of University of Waterloo they would come on campus for the exam day this term I just said when you know there's not going to be any exam and I'm the first one who actually did that so okay. there's no exam for this term that I'm teaching but previously I had exams and I used the Adobe Connect same thing there but it's because not everybody's on board and not everybody understands so yeah so I don't know what should be the online way of going about and, it and, and again my question would be you know why do you want to do exams so essentially what we're we're following here and again we should probably be looking at wendy for, for this that we're actually taking a look at authentic assessment that is paralleling the kinds of processes that we're using for learning with the kind of processes that we're actually using for assessing okay. in other words they should be in sync with each other they should be doing the same kinds of things as they're learning while they're actually doing their assessing. So they end up with assessment being assessment for learning, not assessment of learning. Okay. So um, the challenge comes when you're teaching courses that are engineering driven, uh, mathematical courses, so IT statistics, entirely online. So it's a huge challenge. I was able to do something with the Blackboard and stuff, but it was still a big challenge. Then I also taught operations research, which is like using a lot of mathematical notations. And it was a, another story. I don't want to get into it yeah. as well. So uh, um, I don't know how to check uh, their knowledge. Yeah, you, well, uh, a lot of that has to do with, with the way that you, I'm, I'm suggesting that you, you actually look at the epistemology. Um, we use primarily uh, inquiry-based and problem-based learning kinds of approaches. So that changes the actual orientation for what we're actually doing. It's not about the content anymore. It's about the processes and the individuals determining to a large extent collaboratively in small groups uh, where they want to go and how they're actually going to determine or show us what they have learned. Okay. So that, that can take a number of different kinds of um, formats, different kinds of, of um, mechanisms that they can actually make use of. In fact, a number of different kinds of um, digital technologies that they can use for that, the, the demonstration of what they have actually learned over the, the course of either a few weeks or the entire course, as far as that goes. Um, the, the exam piece, for me, has never been a particularly um, fruitful way of, of going, well, no, I can't say that. Uh, I, I used to be in the classroom for 18 years. Um, I was a uh, high school science ed uh, uh, teacher. And um, one of the last things that I did, so about 95 to about 2000 or so when I was still in the classroom, I went to project-based um, examinations. And where, what I would do is put a number of pieces of uh, um, objects uh, of ver various types in front of students so it would be a practical exam and get them to design some kind of um, scientific investigation right then and there, come up with some kinds of conclusions over the course of about uh, two hours or so in conjunction with two other people that were sitting at that same station with them. Um, they would give, get a couple of opportunities to do these kinds of things, but it's their, their procedural knowledge that they were actually demonstrating as they were going through this, because it really didn't matter what conclusions they came to. It didn't have to conform to what sure. um, had been found in other places, but they had to show us that they could put a valid investigation together. And this is grade nine, grade 10 kind of process, but you could scale it up going into uh, undergrad or graduate kinds of courses as well. Maybe not 100% uh, satisfactory in terms of the response, but 
that's the kind of uh, direction I would move in. Uh, anybody else have any other comments? Uh, I've got, we've got one minute remaining apparently. I would just encourage people to come to our next presentation, the conference is about authentic assessment in this kind of environment, because there's lots of work that we're interested in doing on it. So. It's interesting that online is the stimulus for some of these different conversations about learning habits, because I mean, that these apply equally in any, in any context. Yeah, for sure. This, this raises somehow some of those issues more loudly. Well, it gives us the opportunity, as Francois was talking about uh, this morning. Maybe you want to take just a couple of words to finish off? Just, um, thanks, Ralph. Well, it's just the idea that the minute you're online, you're stuck with a bunch of limitations that are not as obvious when you're in the physical classroom, but become blatantly, painfully obvious when you're online. So some of the things you can get away with in the physical classroom, you can't get away with online. So. These kinds of questions are as valid in the physical classroom, but in online, since it brings it up, that's why we say it, it's an opportunity. Because those limitations sort of like, they, they just slap it right back in your face and, oh geez, I gotta deal with this. But at the same time, complemented by an enormous amount of new possibilities, right? Like having every EC, EC, EG of every member of, uh, of the team. Because you, because you, you at the same time about and correlating, you know, a massive amount of possibilities. Because you're forced to think about it, and all of a sudden, oh geez, I mean, I can do this. Yeah, you could have done it in the real classroom too. Why didn't you do it? Well, here's the other piece. Uh, try this in a physical classroom. All I did was just click on one button, and now I've got four additional rooms that are immediately available. You can send people into them, or they can go themselves, and they can have small breakout rooms right then and there. And they've got all of the same tools that we've got in the main room available in the breakout room, including being able to record any of the work that they're doing. Now, they can't actually do the video recording, but that's the only piece that they yes. can't do. Matter of time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so very much. Thank you to my colleagues. Uh, Maurice, we didn't hear much from you, and uh, Ulana, and Wendy, and Judith. Um, thank you so very much for taking an hour out of your Saturday afternoon. I appreciate it an awful lot, and uh, thank you to all of you. <laughs>